прапор у нас в Британии и Украине у вікні. А, до речі, так. Це, напевно, хтось з українських солдатів. Вони коли їздили на Британію. Добрий день. Unsurprisingly, it's not a gun. But the microphone my producer Adley is holding in her hands and pointing towards me. To be fair though, they're not entirely wrong. It's a bulky black thing with a handle and a fuzzy bonnet at one end. It could be some sort of weird gun. We're 10 kilometers from the outskirts of Kiev, standing in a playground in an apartment complex in Hostomol. In a third floor window, in one of the flats in front of us, we can see a split Ukrainian and a Union Jack flag. Hostomol is part of the small cluster of suburbs that were on the front lines in February and March 2022. Their names, Bucha, Irpin and Hostomol, became bywords for occupation, brutality and war crimes. Two years on, life has somewhat returned to these towns, but traces of the war are everywhere including the playground. So this... Our translator points towards the playground centerpiece. Do you know, do you know guys, the plane, um, Maria? Yeah. A climbing frame in a rather unusual shape. It was the copy of that. <laughs> Is it most smaller? It's slightly smaller. smaller. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then yeah. you can see the, all these uh, traces of bullets everywhere. Correct me if this is wrong. Was, it's the biggest plane in the world. It's a giant transport plane. And the airport in Hostomol had at least one of those. And this ch- children's play park in front of us has been designed like the Maria uh, plane. The word means dream, I think, in Ukrainian, doesn't it? Exactly. And, yeah. Um, it was just. It was one of the first massive things destroyed by Russian by the Russian bombing yeah. campaign in the early days of the war. And photos of that went all around the world's press and the world media. Uh, and here's the children's play park in front of us, in sort of now in commemoration, I guess, of the plane. And there's kids with their rollerblades just going past us, looking at uh, looking at us with some trepidation. <laughs> I'm David Knowles, and this is a special episode of Ukraine, the latest. In February 2024. Two years after the beginning of the full-scale invasion, myself and producer Adeli Pojmon-Ponte headed for Kiev. For several weeks, we crisscrossed the capital and the region, seeking out stories and recording everything we could. Over the next few weeks, we'll bring you a series of special reports from our time out there. In this episode, we travel back to Bucha, Irpin and Hostomol to see how life has changed for the people who lived in the path of the Russian military. Some stayed, some left, but all of them are trying to rebuild shattered lives. So we're walking into the sort of apartment complex here, and there's still so much damage that we can see. We can see damage on this, the walls, we can see burnt out cars, there's quite a few uh, lines of houses that have been completely uh, destroyed. Looking up to the uh, apartment block in front of us, quite a few of the windows are still completely blasted out. Um, I'm, I'm a little surprised by this, to be honest. Um, there's quite a few apartments without any windows, and there's, there's obviously some construction work going on, actually. So clearly, two years on, there's still quite a lot of reconstruction that needs to be done here in Hostomol. We've come to Hostomol to meet Roman. He's a tall, 33-year-old journalist wearing a tracksuit, and he lives in one of the flats overlooking the playground. He bought in the town for the location. Hostomol is not far from Kiev and had become a go-to destination for young families seeking more space away from the rush of the city. Roman wants to show us around his neighbourhood and explain what happened during the early weeks of the full-scale invasion, how he fled his home, and what he found when he returned. So I bought the flat, repaired it entirely, and then had oh, not more than one year before Russians came. 24 on the 24th of February 2022, I actually was still awake. So at five o'clock in the morning, when I, the whole missile explosions started, I was not even able to hear them, but to see them through the window here. So the first idea was what's going on, obviously, as all of us had the same idea. And then, then I was thinking I should call my mom and try to find good words to tell her that war started. I didn't know how to do that. Did he find those words eventually? It was not able to pronounce the word war. Oh. 
Слово війна не звучало з моїх уст. Through my window, we were constantly observing like air battles, Russian fighter jets з якими ми були знайомі, і ми весь день просто спостерігали у вікно за тим, що відбувається. І чи несуть вони взагалі яку загрозу? Роман tells us that he was really confused. Back then, no one knew whose planes were flying so low. Низько, дуже низько. Ну, прямо на рівні твоїх очей. It was completely surreal. Like really uh, big shock. Повне нерозуміння, що це, що відбувається. Складалось враження, що ось ось і це все закінчиться. Sure like, Подібне. От за декілька днів, от ви кажете, ви мамі сказали, почалося. Тобто було таке відчуття. В новинах же ж постійно говорили про це. Але ми між собою, коли розмовляли. Ми гадали, що треба бути uh, I just asked him how was he feeling the days before actually the war was he thinking it will start or was he hesitating he said actually we were like it was all over on TV before for days and days and like the tension was like thicker and thicker anyway but I had still this thought that one should be really really mad mental to actually really believe that Russia will invade us. When did he decide to leave and what happened then? Потім ближче до вечора у дружини мого товариша почалась. So the whole day of 24th we basically were waiting uh, and trying to understand what should we do next because it was quite terrifying and no one was telling us what to do. Було прийнято рішення виїхати в центр Києва на Майдан. And we went to Kyiv and we stayed in the shelter underground of Майдан the whole night. Скажу, що виїжджали ми з повною впевненістю, що наступного So we left being completely sure that next morning we'll come back to collect our like first emergency stuff and then to get ready to to think about what we do next. І повернулись ми сюди, власне, я не пам'ятаю вже дату. Через два чи три місяці. So next time we came back, it was two months later. For two months, Roman wasn't able to return to his apartment. From Kiev, he could see smoke in the sky from the direction of Hostomol. But he had no way of knowing whether his flat was still standing. By the end of March, the Russians were in retreat. But Roman was only able to come back two weeks later. The area had to be demined, and when he returned, there was no electricity, no water, no sewage system. Roman showing us a video now of their re-entry into this, where we're standing, so this playground just in front of, just in the middle of all these apartments, and the ground is all churned up, and there's lots of damage to the apartments, and he's saying that the Russians in the occupation placed a lot of their heavy vehicles here. That's something I've seen quite a bit. And the fact is that that's a mini shell splatter, isn't it? There's quite a lot of the damage is radiating outwards, and you can see where, that, where it's going. Yeah, absolutely, some sort of artillery. So the Roman's showing us pictures of one of his neighbor's flats, and it's completely blown out. There's no um, glass in the windows, and there's rubble everywhere. So it was, was it hit by a missile or a...? Uh, mortar. It was a mortar, yeah. Well, that's not the most important machine, who left it. Тобто картина виглядала трошки So Roman is saying that they chose this building to be their headquarters. The apartment block is many stories high and overlooks the whole city of Ostomol. Because of its strategic position, Roman tells us the Russians used the flats as an observation point. They even occupied his flat. Uh, а ви знаєте, хто що за за дивізія тут стояла? Uh, чесно, я не знаю. Я знаю, He continued to watch Roman's footage of when he returned to his building and his flat. In March 2022. Every flat, every single flat was opened, looted, they took everything. The doors are bashed in. There are dirty plates and glasses and empty bottles of alcohol on every surface. The floor is dirty, and his mattress is propped up against the window. 
Ну, це, власне, можете не прикладати, напевно. The most disgusting evidence of occupation, however, was found in the bathroom. How they put I don't know how to say that in an elegant way. I uh, just okay. just say it say it the most accurate, simple way. I mean they were basically shitting all all around the flat and you know, or in the toilet, everywhere, basically. What was his reaction when he found his flat like this? Roman is saying that HD, uh, his first reaction when he came back was how happy I am to come back home and I'm so grateful that my home was not destroyed. How long did it take him to clean up and did he have any help? So Roman said that he was cleaning himself and he was cleaning it six times entirely. The difficult bit was that I was trying to get rid of the smell and the smell I cannot even explain to you. It's not even something really specific, but the smell of these people living in my house was so awful that I had to clean up a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Чим менше слідів військових дій тут залишається на районі, тим більше ти себе So he's saying once he cleaned everything up and he started buying new plants, he was like, well, I actually start feeling like happy again in this flat. Just across from Roman's apartment, there are several rows of townhouses. Almost all of them are completely burnt out. A lot of Hostomel is like this. Look to your left and you'll see nondescript apartments standing side by side. On your right, empty skeletons of buildings and cars gutted by missile fire and artillery. So we're walking down the street in Hostomel. There's a lot of blackened brickwork, so a lot of fire swept through here. When I was last in the area, I was struck by how the adverts on billboards were dominated by window repair services and funeral parlours. Two years later, I'm a little surprised by how much is still destroyed, despite the efforts made to rebuild. This is sad, by the way, here on this posters is sad. People living in these houses uh, need your help. And it's some sort of um, charity initiative called Rebuild Hostomel, I don't know. Is there any reason why so much of this hasn't been cleared up? I mean, there are burnt-out cars here. This, is, this has been here for two years. So, he says probably people who used to live here had no funds, uh, no help for the state uh, at all, and they, in this way, just by keeping all these cars, burnt cars and destroyed buildings, um, not cleaning it up, trying, uh, trying basically to attract some... Uh, attention of the state about their problem. Can you tell us about the poster? So I've seen this before in this area and in Butra and in Irpin, and I was told that this poster before is which is saying, you know, people, the people here need your help and there's a big QR code and there's the bank details as well trying to persuade people to, to donate money. I was told that people who lived here got quite fed up with foreign journalists and politicians and Ukrainian politicians coming here, taking photos and then leaving and not helping. Is that the case here as well? The Roman says that it does not work, uh, it's not very effective. Basically, people are not donating enough. The people who live in these houses, did they have time to leave before the occupation? Or? I think stories will be quite different every time because if everyone would have left, there were not you know, uh, so many dead bodies afterwards all over Butchen has told me, so. Roman's taking us to what he says is a special spot to show us something. He hasn't explained anything more than that, so we're going to find out, I guess. Roman took us to a busy road that, two years ago, became a killing ground as civilians desperately ran a gauntlet of Russian troops to escape the war. It's the main road to Kiev. 
And from this point to that uh, roundabout, uh, this whole area was covered with the cars, with dead bodies in, inside. If you look at here, you can see this grey wall. So Russians put their armoured personal carrier and were shooting down everyone, like every car trying to escape to Kyiv. And there was a day where they shoot 12 or more in one, just in one single day. So basically, after the occupation, this road was covered with cars, with dead people inside, trying to, all those people who just were trying to, to leave the occupation. Roman falls silent. We've come to the end of his tour of Hostomel. It's been a difficult and sobering day seeing up close the realities of war and what these people went through. We got back into the car and left Roman in Hostomel. Then we headed to Butcher and the apartment of Igor Savchenko. You may remember Igor. He's the father of our friend Katya. Katya shared her experience of occupation with us back in an earlier episode of this podcast. Igor's in his 50s and works as an engineer. The Savchenkos are originally from Donbass. They moved to Bucha due to the Russian assault on the region in 2014. In 2022, the war caught up with them. The Savchenkos sheltered in the basement of a local school and knew several people who were executed by Russian soldiers. They risked their lives to escape. When I first visited Bucha, Igor showed me around the town and we took tea in their apartment just off the main street. More than two years since the liberation, I was keen to hear how Igor was doing. I wanted to know more about the state of reconstruction, how the community was dealing with the memories of Russian troops massacring civilians in the streets, and to find out about his own involvement in the war effort. Also, it's really good to see him again and to be back. Um, Do you want some tea? Ooh. Tea would be lovely. Chai. Chai. We sit in the same kitchen as before. Oh, yes, please. It's been redone since I was last here. Like the town, the flat is being remade step by step. I tell him I recently spoke to Katya, and he smiles. He says, um, because of the fact that Bucha became sort of symbol, and uh, like, a symbol of Russian barbarism, there are lots of uh, funds uh, trying to invest into Bucha, particularly. And he says, I makes me happy as a like uh, someone who lives in Bucha, but it makes me quite sad. So well, thank you so much, and it's so good to see him again. What's changed in the past two years since then? So, as you can see, um, lots of things changed after the occupation in a positive way because there are lots of renovations going on in Bucha. Changes can be as positive and negative as well sometimes. Uh, the negative is the current political situation and the municipality here, like when they have some sort of current problems in Bucha with roads or pipelines or whatever, uh, they see that before the war it was much easier to find funds for that, for the reparation. Now the state obviously has to make some cuttings and sometimes they cannot uh, solve it immediately, unfortunately, because there are more urgent things to take care of. Another heartbreaking detail he's talking about is that there is a, an alley of heroes uh, not far away from his house. An alley of heroes is what Ukrainians call the section of a graveyard reserved for soldiers killed in the war. Which is growing uh, every day, and it's because of people from Butcher Bob fighting currently on the front line and dying every day. Well, uh, the positive change is that we have less and less signs of 
Russian occupation in Bucha every day. Uh, for example, the street of Aksalina, where the whole world uh, saw this, those heartbreaking pictures from uh, covered with dead bodies and um, armored vehicles, completely, completely renovated. It's a collective effort coming from locals, local authorities, funds, charities helping us to rebuild all of this. And every single building is being renovated currently here. Every single supermarket destroyed looted by Russians reopened its doors already. So life is, has come back to Butcher already. All the bridges were renovated. They were blown up by, especially Ukrainians, make sure all Russians were not able to cross the road and to come to Kyiv. Um, so the biggest one, which was closed for a very long time, opened it one month ago, connecting Kyiv to Bucha. Если еще сравнивать вот эту зиму, которая закончилась уже, слава богу. This winter is much, much more positive for his family, for Butcher and European North in general, because um, they didn't have, their electricity was not cut, they had water, they had heating through, through the whole winter, compared to previous one where Russians were trying constantly to target and to blow up our power stations, thanks to our air defense systems. On the day that we're here, you can actually hear outside some of that work is being done, and that's the humming sound in the background that we were hearing. Last time we were here, I remember walking down the street here, and we bumped into some neighbours who were coming back with their bags, I think from Turkey, if I remember correctly. Well, are people still returning from overseas, and how are they reintegrating into the society as it is now? Well, if we're talking about our house, then we've been back to the city for almost a year or more. In his building, um, almost every single family already has come back, um, except the this only family who had that flat targeted by Russian. We saw from the outside the destroyed flat with black smoke window. Uh, so we don't know where they are. The local authorities asked a couple of times because we are they are ready to renovate completely for free their flat. Unfortunately, they have to be here, and uh, it's difficult to, to reach them. Second interesting thing is that um, actually there are lots of people who are constantly living their homes in the eastern and southern part of Ukraine. Uh, so those refugees coming to Kyiv and then seeing Bucha being renovated constantly and funded by local authorities, so like people are taking care of this place here and they are gladly investing. And actually the real estate here is uh, now as high as it was before the war. When you showed us around the school two years ago, I remember there was a, there's an amazing sense of community and... Again, if I remember correctly, you know, lots of people there didn't know each other before they were helping each other in the shelter to survive the occupation. Does that sense of community still survive? Is it growing? On the first days of after the occupation, uh, what we felt is cannot be comparable to anything else because every time when we um, were seeing each other or seeing other people coming back, we were hugging each other and kissing each other and uh, crying of joy. In two years' time, obviously, the everyday life routine uh, taking progressively advantage of the, those feelings. Everyone has its own problems and families and just life. But... Um, Obviously, people uh, who I met in the shelter, I'm still in contact with them. We became very good friends. There is a um, great initiative, especially young people, gathering together, organizing themselves, and then traveling all over Ukraine, trying to help this, like, to 
repair the little villages in Chernihiv, for example, in north of Kiev or Sumy. Basically, now the initiative is to we had enough repair stuff here. We had lots of funds. Now Bucha has to go out of Bucha and try to help. And there are like lots of tiny villages in far away corners of Ukraine where these funds don't go. So young people from Bucha are going there and try to repair the local towns and little houses by themselves. That's the initiative. What's been the experience of being in the sort of international media and Ukrainian media spotlight and then that moving away maybe over the past two years? Do they feel like the attention has moved? And in a way, is that a good thing, that they can get on with their lives without everybody watching? I think, first of all, it's good that we are not all over the front pages anyway. During the days, these first days of the whole world's attention, um, I was thinking that it's not a good thing just because there are hundreds and thousands of butcher everywhere, all over Ukraine. And I, from the very beginning, uh, thought that it would be wrong and it would attract lots of people coming, lots of journalists, politicians, um, but no one would come to Izium, Ahtyrka, eastern villages, southern villages. It was too much from the very beginning. It was unfair. And I think we should have done more for other places. For many people who've gone through horrible experiences, it can be very difficult to talk about it to other people. And sometimes people prefer you know, to move on and not say anything about collective group traumas. What's the situation here? Do people talk about the occupation, about what they went through? For him personally, he was saying that he thought for a long time that what happened in Butcher had not lots of consequences to his psychological state and that he had no traumas. But he said quite recently there was a plane crossing the sky here and he was surprised to actually to see like all his body response was so violent. He was panicking and like being really scary. So in some way, you know, like unconscious state, we are keeping those traumas for sure, he says. Do the people here get enough psychological support then? Yes, I regularly see this publications on Facebook page, for example, of Butcher's official page, inviting people to those centers to have meetings and, you know, some sort of uh, meetings of psychological support. You mentioned the really sad news of the expanding alley of heroes, the, the growing number of graves in the cemetery. What's the situation here in terms of mobilization? Do you see lots of people joining the army from Bucha? It's really hard to say how many people are fighting on the front line from Bucha. He does not have this data, obviously. He says that there is an assessment center in Bucha where he has gone already, gave his documents, they're checking his situation. So that's basically what he can say about his own personal experience. Just for listeners outside of Ukraine who don't know what happens now, could he just talk about, so he's gone, he's given his documents in, what might happen in the next few months? What are the processes here? The situation is the in Ukraine, uh, since the beginning of the war, the law says that every man from 25 to uh, 60 years old uh, can be called up uh, to the front line. 
you have to go to an assessment center not far away from your place of living. You receive a letter from authorities telling you to do that. And in the beginning of the war, not everyone did that, fortunately. So now they are trying to push people to come and at least make first checkup of documents that are they compatible or not to um, the army. Uh, he went to the local assessment center and now he's basically waiting for a medical commission to uh, make the whole checkup and then people there will decide what to do next. He has no vision, no visibility what would be the answer to this war right now. And he says that if the assessment center people working there will consider that he is ready with his health and age and that he will be more useful in the trench with a Kalashnikov in his hands. So yeah, he is ready. Now he is currently working and paying his taxes and he's not a very young guy and he thinks that he is useful enough, but if the state and his country will think that he is more useful out there, he's ready to go because he says anyway, uh, no one wants to die, no one wants to fight. But the question which we have to ask ourselves is in what army we want to serve now in Ukrainian or in a couple of years in Russian army against the West or in the Western army in a couple of years against the Russian he wants to serve the Ukrainian army, basically. Thank you so much for your time. Anything final that you want to say or haven't said that you think we should hear? He wanted to say thank you to people like you coming here and supporting them and to Westerners coming here and to British people who support Ukraine, um, give us funds take our soldiers for training. One of his very good friends currently is in the UK training. But I would wish we were helped a little bit more <laughs> because we really, really need that help. It was time to leave. We finished our tea and said goodbye to Igor. As we put on our shoes in the hall, he invited us back to visit after the victory. I wonder whether the next time we meet, he'll be in military fatigues. I certainly hope not. Pucha, Irpin, Hostomol. Behind each name is a thousand stories of resilience and suffering. It's been two years since the occupation, but it will be many more before the people living here truly find the peace they deserve. We'll be publishing another episode about Pucha soon, where we hear about the effort to prosecute Russian war crimes. Look out for that episode, amongst other exclusive reports, in just a few weeks' time. This special episode of Ukraine The Latest was recorded, edited and produced by Adli pojman Ponte. Translation on the ground was done by one of our friends in Ukraine who prefers to stay away from the limelight. Huge thanks to Igor and Katya Savchenko and Roman. The executive producers were Louisa Wells and me, David Knowles. <laughs> <laughs>